Hello, I'm Father Louis Skirty, and I welcome you to Friends of the Word, the weekday word. We're in the ordinary time of the year, and it's good for us once in a while to reflect on the gospel, its source, its origins, and we'll do that in the scriptures and during the homily today. Thank you for joining us, and pass this on from, to your family and friends. Let me hear from you, Father Lou Skirty at Hotmail.com. God bless you. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, has destroyed death and brought life to light through the gospel. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus withdrew toward the sea with his disciples. A large number of people followed from Galilee and from Judea. Hearing what he was doing, a large number of people came to him also from Jerusalem, from Idumea, and beyond the Jordan, as well as the neighborhood of Tyre and Sidon. He told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, so that they would not crush him. He had cured many, and as a result, those who had diseases were pressing upon him to touch him. Whenever unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. He warned them sternly not to make him known. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, this is the Jesus we all know. He goes around, he's healing people, he's curing them. And Mark, the author of this particular Gospel, does two things here. One, he uses the, the evil spirits to identify Jesus, kind of ironic. But two, he also puts into the mouth of Jesus a stern warning to tell nobody. That's why Mark's gospel is called sometimes the gospel of secrets or the secret gospel. Nothing secret about it, but in the gospel, the way he composed Jesus, Jesus is telling his followers as well as here, the, the, the spirits, don't tell anyone about who I am. Eventually, the way Mark's gospel is composed Jesus, of course, is revealed in the fullness of, of the gospel, which is the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, that's where the gospels started. The passion and death and resurrection of Jesus were the original heart of the gospels. They were the story upon which everything else was built. Then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John put their own spin on it. Okay, that's the, com the composition of the good news, the gospel word. The composition in, in Matthew traces, traces the genealogy of Jesus. Mark, this very short gospel, combines the, quote, the secrecy of Jesus and the revelation of Jesus. Luke talks about um, the wonderful stories we all know and love about Jesus, the, the birth narrative, the magi, and so on. And of course, John, of course, is in his own world, that's because he's not one of the synoptic gospels. John's gospel is ethereal, heavenly. That's why symbolically we associate the eagle with John's gospel because it soars in so many ways. But the heart and the origin of all of the four gospels and the gospel message was the Jesus who came, Jesus who lived, died, crucified, and was resurrected. That's the heart of the gospel. Now, I use that emphasis because today we have a beautiful, beautiful letter, letter to the Hebrews. Now, if you get time, make that letter a, a, a meditation for a month. Just read sections of it. It gives us, through the author's perception, it gives us a full understanding of Jesus having fulfilled the Old Testament. The section we took, we look at today, talks about the role of the high priest in the physical temple. He also mentions that 
the, the, the temple discrepancies, the temple descriptions, I, sh I should say, were given to Moses, okay, on the mount, how to build it, what size, where the altar should be, and so on. That was really what we call an anachronism, is read back into Moses. But what we do have in Hebrews is the reference to the physical temple. And who's in the temple? The priest. What do the priests do? The high priest goes into the Holy of Holies once a year. The high priest offers sacrifice. The high priest and the other priests represent the people. The high priest, a man, therefore a sinner, does something on behalf of all sinners that he can't solve. All he does as an instrument of God is he offers the sacrifice to, quote, appease God. Hebrews, the letter of, of, that we're looking at, and I was going to say of Paul, it's not Paul, we don't know who the author is, is but it is a letter that's very significant to our faith. The letter to the Hebrews says, okay, you know all that, and you realize he's talking to Jews. You know all that, you know the role of the priest, you know what the priest did in the temple, you know how it was built and all that. Now you've got to realize that that was a foreshadowing of the real temple, heaven. And then he goes on to describe the priest in the new temple is Jesus Christ, who is the victim as well as the high priest. He offers himself, very interesting, unblemished. He has no sin. And yet he offers himself as the unblemished sacrifice, the Lamb of God, on behalf of the community that follows him. And that foreshadowing also relates to us today. What we do when we gather at Mass is a foreshadowing of the heavenly kingdom. Now, <clears throat> in the kingdom of God, in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the temple of heaven, whatever you want to call it, I'm sure there's no altar like this. There's no flowers around the altar. There's no me sitting in front of the altar preaching. It's the fulfillment of everything we do. What we do here is simple. Our prayers are always directed to the Father. Our prayers are always directed through Jesus, our role model, guide, teacher, and brother. And our role is given to us inspired by the Holy Spirit. So when we gather here, Sunday Mass, weekday Mass, it doesn't matter. We are foreshadowing the heavenly temple. We are doing here on earth what is being done in heaven. Now, people aren't adoring God in heaven. All of creation is adoring God. The angels, the saints, the, those who've gone before us from earth, adoring God in heaven. Because if they're there, they're adoring God. Sounds a little on the boring side if you look at it from one perspective. But we can't look at it from the anthropomorphic level. We can't say all these people in heaven are like standing around saying, yay God, yay God, because that would be very boring. But they're spirits. Again, this is a foreshadowing of the reality of heaven. That God is all in all. And that God, through Jesus Christ, has touched all those who are there. Because they're in heaven, so they're already redeemed. And the Holy Spirit is enjoying the companionship and, and the community of heaven. So what we do here on earth is a foreshadowing of what goes on in heaven. And again, foreshadowing, not exact duplicate. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, to today. If you go to a Byzantine church, say the Melkite church, their, their physical churches reflect that theology. Their music does. Their use of incense does. Uh, their, their singing, their bells, all of that reflects the theology of the foreshadowing. Their altars centered. If you look way up into the center of the building, you have the big Pantocrator, big Christ blessing. And around the rims of that, coming down right to the, to the ground level, you'll have the angels adoring Christ, you'll have the saints, then, then you'll have the apostles, then you have the fathers of the church, and then current saints. So it shows the progression to heaven and, of course, the re-outreach to earth. Now, 
it, even with their incense, now here we don't use incense so much. I think people cough here or they have um, different reactions to it. So I, I'm limited to using my incense here in this particular building. But in the Byzantine church, people don't cough, I guess, with incense there. They use the incense as what it represents, a raising up of our prayers to God. Not to smell. It's a raising up of our prayers to God through all the senses. Even on the censers that they use in the Byzantine church, there are 12 bells. So every time the priest or the deacon incenses, they hear the voices of the 12 apostles singing praise to God in heaven as the smoke of the incense rises up. Okay, so what we do here is a foreshadowing in heaven of the, of the new and eternal Jerusalem and epitomized on earth through the example of the, the Melkites or the Byzantine communities. So what are we doing? We're coming together and we're praying for one another. We're coming together, we're praying for the ill. We're praying for the victims of, of earthquakes. We're, we're praying for healing. We're praying for those who have, dis, who have died. We're praying for the poor. And what we're doing is we're gathering all those prayers and offering them up to the Father. We don't physically see the prayers going up. Our voices, our spirit, raise them up to God. So in asking God for all these things that we ask him for, and sometimes we don't ask God, we just praise him because he's God, our voices are going to heaven like the incense. Our voices are going to heaven like the incense in the temple, like the sacrifice in the temple, like the cross and holy resurrection, and us gathering at our own altars on earth. When we praise God through placing before him our petitions of need, of, of praise, of want, whatever they are, we're praising God. Why? Because we're acknowledging who he is. He's the answer. He's the summit. He's the apex. He's the source of our prayers. And the irony of it is, beautiful, as we pray for others to God, the blessings come back to us. Because we're acknowledging the presence of God in our lives, in the lives of those for whom we're praying. And God looks to his son, you might say, and says, job well done, kid, to Jesus. Because you've taught them that their father is your father. You've taught them that all prayer goes to the father in heaven. And you've taught them as we pray and work toward our prayers to live our faith on earth. And that's the whole gospel. What is the gospel? Jesus came, taught, died, resurrected. What's the gospel for us? To follow him to the Father.